A lot of people ask me whether I'm a writer or a painter. When I'm writing, I am a storyteller with a pen. When I'm painting, I am a storyteller with a brush and tubes of color. I was born in 1960 on the island of Taiwan. Had I been born on the mainland, I may not have survived the great famine that was raging across the land, taking somewhere between 30 to 40 million lives. My great-grandfather succumbed during those years. At the time, I was emerging into the world, so I've often felt that I'm his reincarnation. He is a protective spirit, urging me on to work on his stories, but oftentimes making me feel very guilty for not doing it faster. <laughs> you know about Jewish guilt. You know about Catholic guilt. Well, Chinese guilt is even more pungent. <laughs> It's had thousands of years to ferment. <laughs> I came to the United States in 1967 with my parents. This is a picture of our first day in the United States, looking a bit nervous. That was a year in which I began moving away from my own culture and heritage, because being Chinese in no way helped me to fit in outside the home. Being Chinese meant all sorts of uncomfortable things, including inheriting the memory of wars. In the last 200 years, China has suffered the First Opium War, the Second Opium War, Taiping Rebellion, Boxer Rebellion, the fall of the Qing Dynasty, Civil War, Japanese invasion, incursion of the Soviets in the north, and then the wars that the communists unleashed upon their own people. It took a physical return to China before I would regain a degree of cultural security and pride because the memories that I inherited also included hunger, the memory of locusts that would swarm across the provinces, eating up all the rice, the millet along the way. Being Chinese also meant understanding the layers of cynicism that is born of a country with thousands of years of history, the cynicism that is hammered under one authoritarian state after another. Chinese is a darker language. Meo fa is a typical uh, phrase. It means nothing can be done. It's up to the gods. I can't do anything about it. American English, however, is a bright language. It's flexible, and I've often wished that I didn't understand Chinese. It took a physical return to China before I would regain a degree of cultural security and pride. I wanted to go to China early on during my college years, but I was forced to go in 86 when I was 26 years old because of a lover turned violent, turned stalker, who broke into my parents' home in Carmel when I came home to seek a haven. He took away a lot of valuable things that were personally important, like my father's calligraphy and his paintings. But I was able to work with the investigators, put him in jail. Meanwhile, I went to China. Later, he got out on a plea bargain, but I was already safe in China. Great. Bad luck is often the turning point for great good luck. So I was able to spend three years in China traveling, but the best part was that I was able to spend the entire Chinese New Year with my grandparents, who were in their 80s. I wish I had the questions to ask them to take me back into the past, but I was much too self-absorbed at that time. My gr grandfather is in the suit, my father closest to me, and my grandmother holding my youngest uncle. My grandmother would sit up in the middle of the night, lean over, and listen to my grandfather's heart to make sure it was still beating. They had struggled through so much, and they supported each other through all, throughout the chaos of the 20th century. I was able to travel deep into the Gobi Desert. This is Ma Ti Si, which is Horseshoe Temple on the southern edge of the Gobi Desert. I traveled to Dunhuang, the grotto of a thousand Buddhas, filled with a vast treasury of Buddhist paintings and sculptures. And here I'm in Hunan, with its rich rice land, with several crops of rice every year. 
Among the Miao minorities, they are related to the Hmongs of Southeast Asia. And the water buffaloes, they were quite gentle, but they look fearsome, and I was too scared to get any closer here. <laughs> it was also a great privilege to see the rise of the democracy movement, and I saw it quelled brutally. These have been never, never been published. It was taken by a friend of mine, a Chinese friend who ultimately escaped to, to France. So I came home. I realized that the violence that the state unleashed in, on its own people to silence them was the same violence that Rotten Egg, the name my father gave my stalker, um, also instilled on me. My mother and father asked me to stay quiet for a year to do my calligraphy and to paint as a form of meditation. And slowly I was able to regain my composure, come home, and take a time to pause. This piece is called Pause. My father taught me about the great learning of Confucius, where you have to attain stillness, stability, then you can meditate and ultimately achieve your goals. My mother said, in a year's time, you'll know exactly what you need to do. And her words turned out to be prophetic. On a dark and stormy night, when the power went out, my father started telling stories of old China about a woman who lost her son to the wolves. And from that humble beginning, a painting came about, and that led to many books for adults and children. This is from the first book. The subtitle of Baba is A Return to China Upon My Father's Shoulders, from the second book, The Odyssey of a Manchurian. The book that's closest to my heart is Forget Sorrow, about my great-grandfather, a Chinese King Lear story. And I feel that my great-grandfather saved my life. Around 1999, I was diagnosed with an immune disease. I was down to under 80 pounds. I couldn't make my own blood cells, so I had lots of transfusions. And I couldn't eat, couldn't breathe, couldn't really talk. But my great-grandfather came in a dream, and he was in a L.A. shopping center of all places. <laughs> but it, it seemed like he was there to tell me, you're sick now, you're in the hospital, but you haven't finished my story. You've got to get up and continue. So I did get up, and when I turned 40, on my birthday, I started making red blood cells again. My great-grandfather had wanted to divide the land among his four sons, but ultimately no one got the land because the communists came and took everything away. They forced him to go out into the world as a beggar, and he died of hunger, but also of heartbreak, because none of his children would take him in, fearing that they would suffer the same fate. Now, in giving voice to my parents, who have given their voice to a long chain of others, I've been able to grow the strength of my own voice. Soon after I had finished the last book, I woke up one day without fear in my heart. I was somersaulting inside. I realized that I no longer feared my stalker, Rotten Egg, that I could tell my nightmares to disappear to roll under the bed like dust bunnies. My greatest desire has been to instill in children a desire to ask about their own past. And most often it is the adults who come up to me after a talk and say, I wish I had known what songs my parents listened to when they first fell in love, what songs or what music they danced to. But now that they're gone, I have no answers. Why do we want to know about the past? It's because the past tells us about how we've become who we are today. And the past is especially important for immigrants, and we are all immigrants. We come to this country oftentimes without friends, without family, and without property or real estate. Our storied landscape of the past provides solid ground upon which we can stand and leap into the future, a better future. Now, I want to leave you with a, a way, a key to unlock the memories of your elders. For the Chinese, 
The stomach is the organ of knowledge and of remembrance. If you're well read, you have lots of ink in your belly. <laughs> if you know someone intimately, you're a bug in their belly. So begin asking, what foods do you miss, grandmother or grandfather, from your childhood that you can no longer get? Either they've immigrated or they've moved from, let's say, the south to the west coast. Or like my father, when he went back to China, he wanted a simple bowl of porridge made from sorghum. But the sorghum uh, uh, had been changed, so it was a very bitter bowl. So this is my story for today, and I hope you will begin to elicit stories from your elders. You will be surprised by the vast flow of stories, and oftentimes they will be quite poetic, like my friend who says whenever he sees the wind blowing, he can taste watermelons. I wish you good luck and bon voyage. <laughs>